Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of Pot and I'm your host, Shwini Poo, in this episode 433, part two. Uh, I am joined, as always, by my co-host Stacy. That is at Stacy Patton89 on Twitter. Stacy, how are you doing? Doing pretty well. Pretty lovely day. It is a lovely day. We are talking uh today on Wednesday, uh prior to the Knicks playing the Wizards in a preseason game tonight. Uh we'll talk Talk about the first preseason game and plenty of other things. But before we do that, I do have to make a few announcements. First, being that the Strickland has a YouTube channel. Check that out. That's uh, you can obviously find us on there. If you're watching on there, please like, subscribe, rate us, leave us a comment. That'd be a huge help to us. The Strickland also has merch, which you can find on our website at www.strick.land. There's a link they'll take you to the merchandise store, and there's all kinds of cool stuff on there, like t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, coffee mugs, water bottles, you name it. We've got it. The Strickland also has a patreon which you can subscribe to there are a number of different tiers there's a six dollar tier that gets you access to pod circlin's podcast that i host every friday at the press you also get access to takes from obvious bozos a podcast hosted by andrew Steele, aka doug along with zach bladder and you get access to the strickland discord where the conversation never stops there are further tiers is a nine dollar tier that gets you access to strickland or all my solo pod or i rant and rave but then it's even more you also get access to wonderful premium articles by matt Murray, one of the best in the business and now you also get access to strictly nfl which, you guessed it, is our pod about the NFL that is hosted by Constantine Metricos and Desmond Novak. There are further tiers. There's a $15 tier, $30 tier, $50 tier, and $100 tier. Those come with a variety of additional benefits, like listening to me on pod recordings, merchandise discounts, and even potentially co hosting a podcast alongside yours truly one day, whether you choose to subscribe or not, and this will be possible without you. And now this will be possible without Bet Online. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during the games. Think you know yourself? Get in on our $200,000 mega contest to pick five games against the spread every week for your chance at weekly prizes and a share of $200,000. When the game is over, head on over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of our over 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on the action. Bet Online, <clears throat> the game starts here. Um, so, I mean, look, we did get a glimpse of the new look Knicks uh, on Sunday. They played the Charlotte Hornets to, you know, it was a game that occurred. I didn't think it was a super competitive game. I, I mean, I guess the best way I could put it is I don't think the Knicks took it as a joke. Um, I think they definitely, like, were trying to establish some things, uh, especially on the offensive end. and. Um, you could definitely see the vision of what they're going for and they have stuff that they need to work through, which I think, you know, obviously that's what the preseason is for. So I was satisfied with what I saw, but like, you know, I saw some stuff about like, Oh, look, Mikhail Bridges getting roasted by LaMelo ball or whatever. And I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I thought that was all like defensively. Like I, I don't think the Knicks were necessarily the most locked in they've ever been, especially particularly the starters, I should say. Um, Obviously, the bench guys come in. I think they have to have it. They have to have a different energy because, kind of, you know, they're fighting for roles and minutes in a way that starters aren't. Um, and I think you could sense that kind of difference in the energy. But overall, I was pretty satisfied with what I saw. I actually thought offensively there was a lot of really good things. And, you know, I, I was very encouraged by Towns taking as many threes as he did. Uh, he went one for five, if I remember correctly. Uh, that's something that you would expect to improve just given his kind of, you know, his general track record as a shooter. Um, and, you know, uh, all that, obviously, like, I, and I think there's there's benefits to him taking those shots even when he's not making them, which you were also apparent to me during that game. Uh, you know, there's stuff that they need to clean up. Like, should Josh Harpy one pass away when you're running that pick and roll with Brunson and Cat? Probably not, right? Um, and, and how you figure all that stuff out. Like maybe, you know, I thought they did a good job, or at least we saw them do a good job of using Hart as a role man in those lineups. And I thought those were really effective looks. Um, you know, they need to probably, not probably, they definitely will need to get McCall Bridges, get OG and Anobi more involved offensively in the half court. Um, but aside from a little injury scare that OG gave us, because of course he has to give us an injury scare, uh, there was nothing I was, concerned about watching that game uh aside from and and i look this is just expected cat in pick and roll he's got a plug he's got he's they're going to have to move him higher to the level of the screen because you can tell when he's in drop uh that's just not something that he's super comfortable at and i think he really struggles 
you know, taking away the pocket pass and also like cutting off the drive. So playing him up higher at the level of the screen, you know, maybe having a more aggressive help coming from the weak side, stuff like that is things they will need to work on. But overall, I, I came away from that feeling pretty okay about what I saw uh, from the starters. And then, you know, I thought I, I, what I was honestly a little bit most, I'm not even going to say surprised by, but interested in was uh, Deuce McBride was pretty much exclusively used as an off guard, a combo guard, however you want to put it. Like obviously did do some ball handling, but the majority of the ball handling when Brunson was off the floor was done by campaign um, or even Kolek later in the game. And I don't, I think, I think McBride played a little, like he played a few minutes with Kolek at the start of the fourth quarter, if I remember, but it, it wasn't, they didn't play much together. Um, but I thought that was interesting. And I think that I know there's been a debate of like, who should start Josh Hart or, you know, Deuce McBride or whatever. And, you know, I, I get that argument and I think he does deserve, I think not forget deserve. I think you, we need to at least see what he looks like in that lineup. Even if it's not, a genuine camp battle to see who starts. I just think you need to get a look at like a true five out lineup like that. Um, so I'm curious to see it, but you know, I actually think it bodes well for him. If Tibbs is kind of viewing him more as a combo guard, because he can like, if Josh Hart subs out first, Deuce McBride can come in for him. If Mikhail Bridges subs out, Deuce McBride can come in for him. If OG Ananobi comes out, like Deuce McBride can come in for him and you can slide Josh Hart down to the, down to the floor or whatever. Like, he's going to get plenty of minutes as an off ball guy. And I almost would have been more concerned if he was being used, like you're the backup point guard, because we already know like how many minutes of that are there really a game, right? Like 14. Um, so to see him used in that off ball role and for him to just look dynamic the way he did, I thought that was all very, very encouraging. You can just see the confidence that he has carried over from the end of last season into now. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I was very encouraged by what I saw from him. And I, I kind of, I like, I, I, there was already reporting last year that the Knicks kind of viewed him more as a combo off ball guy than as a legit point guard. So it's not like this was unexpected. And obviously we saw him used plenty of in that role last year too, but I think just seeing it again and it reinforced it. And I think, um, you know, there should be plenty of minutes for him to go around in that capacity that's up to Tibbs obviously to figure out and he will need to figure that out. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think overall there weren't any major fit issues um, that you could see, which would be the big worry. Um, you know, where you place heart, you know, kind of the shooting aspect that those are things they're gonna have to tweak. Um, I actually thought cat was reasonably good in drop. He had a couple of good reps better than I expected. Um, that said, I would like to see him play closer screen. I think historically that's where he's done well. Um, but you could really see the um, the potential, right? Um, you know, there was that one, the one three hit, he kind of just walked into a transition three from way deep. The Knicks have simply not have had anyone who can do that since Porzingis, really, uh, at that size. Um, and that is one of the most frustrating things about playing Porzingis is you know, you get back against a pretty dangerous transition team, which the Knicks are looking to be as well. Uh, you cover all your bases, and then it's almost like a cheat code, right? This guy, you can't contest, just walks in. Even if he could contest, he's shooting from so deep. Um, so, I mean, you could see clearly. I was really impressed with Cat's passing, actually, um, much more than I thought. So I think that the drives are a little hairy. Um, he doesn't seem to have the best handle in traffic considering how often he drives. I mean, for a 6'10 guy, it's normal. Um, but he seemed to be much more comfortable passing from the post. It wasn't, you know, people have compared Randall's passing to Cat's. This is just one game. But from what I could see, there was a lot more anticipatory passing. He's throwing guys open. Um, he's thinking a move ahead, right? It's the window may not already be there. Whereas with Randall, it was kind of see the read, see the open guy, and zip a pass to him, right? There was a little more touch on Cat's passes. Uh, I think from a standstill, he's... I, I cautiously looks like a better passer than Randall or a little bit more dynamic. Um, but, you know, I think Randall probably off drives was better as a passer uh, and a little bit, I think cat will be more turnover prone than Randall on drives. Weird is enough to say, cause Randall obviously had his own adventures there. Um, but, you know, I, I echo what you said with the starters, uh, particularly on defense, like heart 
was not playing particularly hard on defense. And we know of his attitude toward practice. The guy brings it on game day. That's not a guy you ever have to worry about, really. Um, you know, so OG was, you know, fine. He hit, got blocked in a couple of attempts. I think the first one was just a a nice play by LaMelo. It was good timing. It was like a lack of lift. The second one, I think it was he got pinned under the rim, really, by it. I think it was Richards or it was a big. So, you know, you can't um, – I can't, you know, it looked like from a spacing perspective, the offense, you know, they're drawing a ton of attention on the cat Brunson pick and rolls. Um, You know, I think Benji um, Ritholtz did like a nice thread showing that pick and roll chemistry still coming, you know, cat, when should cat pop? When should he roll? You know, when should Brunson kind of be aware of like looking for that pop? Cause he, you know, he's playing with a roller for the first time in a while. Um, kind of Brunson also likes to go at a little bit of a different herky jerky pace. So cat is going to have to get used to that. Um, and then, um, but you know, you could see the outlines of a really effective offense. <laughs> um, I thought cat was honestly a little bit better than I expected on defense. You know, it's preseason was effort wax and wane. We'll have to see that. Uh, I thought the bench guys were mostly pretty good. I thought deuce was awesome. Like obviously he's going to play hard. Um, but I think to your point, like focusing on one role, um, will help. And I think that, you know, in the summer I really was kind of, you know, I, I didn't think Payne would get minutes or Kolek, but now with Dante gone, there's a clear need at that sh- backup shooting guard position. So you can keep Deuce out there. Um, I actually liked a lot of what I saw from campaign. Um, the guy naturally has like, you know, the instincts to run an offense, to see the whole floor. He's a good ball handler. Uh, and he's got really good touch. I mean, that shot is fucking ugly, but it's very effective. Um, and it's, I have to say, it's a lot nicer seeing that shit go in when you're rooting for them than when, like, nobody on Philly can miss in game three and your center's getting knocked out by a dirty player uh, and then campaigns hitting that bullshit. Like, but he's, he's effective. I thought Shamit showed that he can give them quality minutes too. He plays a little bit bigger than his size, I think, because of his wingspan. So might even be able to pinch in at the three as well. Um, so for a team that was really worried about its depth, I think that was encouraging. Um, and I, you know, I, I think Precious showed that he's capable of being a backup center um, and giving you some minutes there. Uh, I think the skill on offense, he banked in a three, so I'm not going to count that. Um, but the skill on offense is coming still. But, he, you know, the bench showed that they're lively rotation guys that shouldn't be an issue. And I'm sure there are more moves to come. And I'd be remiss to mention that the Knicks were actually saved by a former Nick who started, who was on this team just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and of course, Dwayne Washington Jr. delivered home the victory after all, uh, all felt like it was lost. Yeah. Shout um, out Dwayne Washington Jr. I, that, I, I just hate that call in general, <laughs> by the way, like that call. I just hate that call. I'm sorry. Like he blocks the shot. The guy like lands between Precious's legs. Like they don't actually make contact, and the like he doesn't impede his landing area, so the guy makes contact on Precious because he jumps forward. Uh, I just I hate that call. I I, I will I, I don't get it, and I it was it's especially annoying because they they again in this game, and I I'm not again I'm not I'm not gonna get pissed. I I'm not pissed about this, but it is annoying. Where like if you call that fine, but then they didn't call Brunson had like two threes. Where the guy comes over, clearly lands in his landing area and takes him out. They don't call either of them, and it's like I I don't know I I don't get that one. I, I don't understand why. Like if you're gonna call that, you gotta call it consistently. You can't just be like, well, this one is, that one isn't. I I'll, it it to me it's pretty straightforward. If if you're gonna fucking call it, personally, I think they should get rid of that rule. I think the landing area rule is a joke, and I get what the motivation was to do it initially, but. I think it's just become so horribly called and officiated and, and, and horrible because it's not consistent in L and I understand why it's, I mean, it's a difficult call to make, but um, yeah, I just, I, that was very, very annoying. And like, again, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's a preseason game. And if they lost, nobody would have cared, but you're not, you're not going to quote Sheed. Yeah. Well, the ball don't lie, but uh, I just, if that, if that, if that was a regular season game and that was how it ended, I would have been furious, especially obviously, if the Knicks won the or lost the game, um, that would have been, uh, yeah, that would have just been a joke. Um, either way, that was not uh, campaign. Yeah, I thought he looked lively. 
he at least seems to compete defensively. I, he's got real limitations given his frame and, and whatever, but he does seem to at least kind of give what he can on that side of the ball. Uh, the three-point shot was not good in this game, but he's a pretty good three-point shooter for his career, so I'm not again, not that worried about it. Seeing him get into the paint, I think he's got a good like herky-jerky style to him where his ability to get into the paint and, and kind of put pressure on a defense – is not something I'm worried about. Like, I think that's, especially against bench units, that should be something that he's able to provide. And it, it's something he provided when we played against them last year in the playoffs to a certain degree. And he's um, a score, he's a score first player, it looks like, but he's pretty adept at finding shooters. I thought, I thought playing off of him to your point earlier was good for Deuce, you know? So, um, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I was encouraged by that for sure. Shamit looked good. Um what I was this is what I will say about Shamit. I saw like he's like very, 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 very I, I don't say this even like to try and draw a, a a direct line between them. He's like a heavy fucking slim fast Jenny Craig diet version of Dante DiVincenzo. Um Ooh. he's going to there's launch threes. I am not that worried about him in the regular season at all. Like his regular season production for his career, it's basically like he's like a 37, 38% guy, especially when he plays on good teams. Last year he was on the Wizards, who were terrible. He was not good, 33% from three. I think that's probably the outlier in his career. Um, on good teams, he tends to shoot the ball pretty well over the course of his career. Defensively, he tries. I he's also a little bit bigger, bigger than Dante, right? Like, you can play. You probably will have to play him at the three, but he's got a six-seven wingspan, six-four, so a little six-five actually from the combine. So definitely a little bit bigger, but probably not as strong as Dante. No, well, neither of them is like super physical, but like you can probably play him at the three and be fine on the bench, right? Right. Um, so it's yeah, like I, I'm the Shaman thing is you know I'm not like. It's fine. Like he, you got him on a minimum. For I mean, he's taking over the Burks role, right? I yeah, he, that for, role. All, for all intents and purposes, he's going to be, you know, uh, hopefully like a 50 minute night guy. He's going to come in, launch some threes. He'll try on defense. I don't know that all of that will always be good. Um, and that's, that's enough. You're like, you're just trying to cobble together a competent, bench unit right like that's really what you're trying to do and as far as like him playing the three this is why i am very curious to see what tibbs does come to start of the regular season i really hope this sims thing sims and pressure thing is not like a thing like i i think the the obvious pivot and the like the one i have kind of you know going back to when we talked about this you know we talked about trading for cat back in like july even going back to then and, and obviously since the trade I've consistently said I think the best way to kind of like buoy the bench unit and artificially kind of boost their offense is playing cat, right? You play cat next to precious or whatever, and sure it's a big lineup, but because cat can spread the floor, whether you want to call him the five or the four in that lineup, you're still you've you've still got pretty good spacing. You know, like Deuce, Campaign, Shamit, Cat, Precious, like that spacing is pretty good. I think it's pretty natural. Um and like Cat is a better, much better rebounder to me than Jericho fucking Sims on top of everything else. And Precious is a fine rebounder. And I think like that is a better rim protector than Jericho yeah, Sims. Right. And and so I just think you need that next to a lineup, you know, the three guys in terms of Payne, Shamit, Deuce, who are not exactly the strongest guys on the board. It's like you need to have some integrity on the glass there. And that's where, like, you know, whether it be playing big with Cat or playing small but you have josh hart out there like i think figuring that out is going to be very important and i just hope that like as the preseason goes along we see more mixing and matching with starters playing with the bench because we know that like i mean you're, you're gonna have stiffer tests than whatever the hell the lineups the bench is playing against against charlotte um and we just need to be prepared for that so like i i get why he wanted to I think, you know, probably the starters were on some minute restriction or, you know, he wants to be cautious with them. And so maximizing their time together was key for him in this game. But hopefully tonight and, and in the 
next regular few season. more yeah, well, regular season. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think he, he uses the preseason pretty consistently as like a strong dress rehearsal for the regular season. Like, we'll have a we should have a good idea of what the lineup and rotation are going to be by the start of the regular season. So, let me. Um, um, I, I want to pose this back to you though. I would have agreed with you that Cat is probably the guy you want booing bench lineups. The Knicks are in a little bit of a different position now, though, where they have a fair amount of guard depth, um, but not a lot of uh, center depth, right? So I think the issue right now, especially with Mitch out, the issue with Cat booing the bench unit is when's he going to rest, right? Him and Precious are going to play a ton of minutes. Is there an argument that while Mitch is out, Brunson should be the – you bring out Brunson early, you, you bring in Deuce or you bring in Payne, um, you know, to – like midway through the first quarter and then you bring Brunson back with the second unit where we know he's capable of doing that. Uh, and then, you know, can cat, you know, if, if it's deuce or if someone, but you still have, you still have quality shooters, you have good spacing, but cat is running the offense against, you know, and then sits with when the bench is out there. Do you think that's just more, if you're going to stagger the easier way to do it right now, just because of the lack of center depth, but we do have a lot of guards, right? So. Yeah, I mean, maybe I, I just, I don't know. Uh, the Brunson thing, like, all this is very fluid. Like, you're going to get, I mean, we've seen, like, even last year, he was staggering way more than he has in the past. So you would hope that continues. But, like, so Brunson can play. I'm sure he'll play with bench units at times. And so will Cat, and so will Mikhail Bridges, and so will Josh Hart. It's a matter of figuring out, like, kind of who is, what are the looks that you're really trying to go for there. Who is the first sub in? Who is the first sub out? All those things are relevant. You know, I think the first sub will tell us everything. So if like the first subs are Deuce coming in for Brunson. McAl Bridges or yeah, or Brunson, then we'll know that that guy is probably the one that at the start of the second quarter is going to be in with the bench and, and buoy them. If he likes campaign, which it seems like he does, I just don't think he's going to have Brunson be the first one out. I think it will always be like a guy like, Macau or who obviously could also help with the bench or cat who obviously can also help with the bench. Like that would, I would, I would, I'm guessing it's one of those two guys. And I just think with cat, like, if you take cat out at the six minute mark, precious comes in, precious is probably going to end up pay, playing like 12 minutes straight. Um, and then do you, and then does, and then probably cat, if he comes in at the beginning of the second quarter is probably also going to play 12 minutes straight. Right. I don't know that like it's just a lot easier to to keep the shin, the, the stints shorter if you're bringing out Brunson or, or Bridges, right? Um, I, I I would prefer it to be Brunson because I I'm not sold on Bridges leading the offensive unit. Um, we know Brunson is going to fucking destroy bench units. I think if and when Mitch comes back, I want Cat to be that guy, and and that'll and I think in the playoffs you're right about that that it's, it's not going to be Brunson because you just want him you need him against the elite defensive teams, but. I think given the depth issues right now and just how that's going to play out in terms of the centers having to play a lot of minutes straight, um, unless you bring in Sims, which I think we all want to avoid, I think it has to be a guard. Yeah, I just think it's going to be Bridges. I I don't think it, it, it's not going to be Brunson. It was never Brunson. It hasn't been Brunson for the last two fucking years. It's not going to be Brunson. Like, it's not going to be Brunson, and it's not going to be Cat. probably. That's the first sub out because that was also not a thing he ever did. The first sub out has always consistently been a guard. He was, yeah, a was shooting like, guard. Yeah, RJ like or Grimes or Yeah. So Dunker. it'll be one it'll be one of those guys. Then they will come back in. And it's important to remember, like Cat could play the first eight minutes sub out and then come back in with, I don't know, eight minutes left in the second quarter. Like that's also fine to me. Um he has a lot of ways he can manage this. So I'm not too worried about that. I just want to see a little bit more mixing and matching uh, than we did in <clears throat> in the first game, which, again, like, not that concerned about that. I think you're just trying to get guys minutes and, and make sure that they're staying healthy while also getting them game ready for the regular season as best as you can. Um, speaking of the regular season, uh, so the Knicks will play the Celtics. Uh, that is on what October 22nd, I think. I don't know what the hell it is, whatever. Um, that should be an interesting test for the Knicks. Obviously, the Celtics are the defending champions, unfortunately. Uh, sad time in American history. Uh, this is an NBA shirt, by the way, not a Celtics shirt. 
I just realized I'm wearing green on the pod, so I don't want to send uh, any yeah. mixed signals. Yeah, we gotta make sure that's cool. Yeah, it's it's Tuesday, October twenty second is the Knicks opening game. Uh, they have three pre or four or four preseason games between now and then. They play the Wizards tonight. They play the Timberwolves on Sunday. Hornets next Tuesday, and then close out with the Wizards again next Friday. Um, so well, there there's plenty of time obviously to figure it out before you play the Celtics. But you know, uh, you know, look, okay, we just got to talk about it because obviously uh, the Wizards game, whatever, we'll see what happens tonight. But the Timberwolves do come into town on Sunday. Uh, Julius Randle did not play in their first preseason game. We know based on the reporting while he was here that um, he might not kind of play much in preseason, if at all, given his recovery from his dislocated shoulder. Uh, do you think he's going to be back on this game? I, I feel like they won't play him on Sunday because they because they're going to obviously they're going to come back at some point. In the regular season too, I think in January, I think January seventeenth actually. Um, but like, it would—I I don't know—it it would just feel weird if like those guys were back in preseason and then you're already gonna have to do like the whole tribute thing and whatever. I don't know. It just—it would—it would feel odd, odd to me. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think he'll probably travel with the team still, right? Maybe. I mean, yeah. if he's doing rehab still, it, it might not. So yeah, I mean, he won't get the moment, uh, you know, being introduced. But if he if he comes with the team, I'm sure they'll do a tribute, um, and you know, like shout him out in street clothes to the the Madison Square Garden crowd. Um, I mean, if he's doing rehab, I would imagine, imagine, I would imagine his doctor's probably here anyway, right, in New York. Uh, I mean, I'm sure some of his doctors are, yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, if that was would be the reason, and he's still rehabbing and. Like he can't practice. I wonder if he would just be staying here anyway. Um, so I'm sure Leon would be like, "Come to the Garden for that game. Be with your team, and we'll honor you." Um, I'm, I mean, I, I think it'll be fine. Um, but uh, and maybe they'll still be able to do the Dante tribute, right? Uh, who did look, by the way, quite good um, and in midseason form already with the um, with the Wolves. Um, I did want to. I think that. Getting back to what you're saying, that Celtics game, I think it's great to have it the first game of the season. I don't expect the Knicks to win. Um, the Knicks are integrating new parts. They seem to fit pretty well together. Um, I would like to see a little bit more from Mikel. Um, I think there can be a danger. Like Dante was great at aggressively hunting spots and shots. Um, that was something that obviously Grimes struggled with, right? He would go long periods without touching the ball. He kind of blamed the offense for it. Um, we've seen that happen with RJ Barrett, right? Where he would be very integrated and then would kind of fade. You've seen it with really Obi Toppin too, right? Where that was an excellent cutter. And to be fair, the Knicks didn't have the kind of playmaking they do now. Um, so he tried really hard and he would hunt shots, but even he could be left a little bit as an afterthought in the offense. I do want to make sure, like, I hope to see more from Mikhail, like hunting those opportunities you know, he took a movement three, you know, he's, he's been able to do that in the past. Um, you know, he doesn't have to play exactly like Dante, but making sure he's not an afterthought and, and how they integrate him into the offense, I think will be interesting to watch, but you know, that's a good measuring stick game, right? You'll see where are they at the beginning of the season against the team that this team was constructed to beat. I mean, there's, there's no secret about it. That's what this team has been built to do. Uh, and you know, like most really arduous tasks, they're probably not going to be successful first time. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll be able to come back to that game and, and compare it. And, you know, we're going to play the Celtics multiple times and, and we'll see how they progress, how things change when Mr. Robinson comes, comes back. So I think that's a good game. Um, I do want to, you know, I do want to talk about a player we haven't talked about yet. Um, the Knicks have a lot of guard depth. I think Payne and Shamit showed that they're more than capable. Um, but watching that, I saw him in summer league and I was like, he looks really heady. He looks like the kind of like, really knows how to play, has skill and touch around the rim. The three-point shot isn't great yet, but you can see it's coming along. It, you look like he'll be able to knock down open threes and, and maybe some some pull-ups as well. Um, but watching the preseason game, it was like, no, nah, I think like he. it seems like he's good enough to be a rotation player. He's the kind of guy we would have been screaming for to get minutes, you know, like that that COVID season and stuff. Uh, curious your thoughts on Kolek and if he might be able to unseat Payne at some point, right? I think Deuce looks pretty safe. 
Um, you know, and, and Shamit might be the only guy who can play the three with that bench unit. So curious your thoughts overall on Kolek, if there's anything that's changed for you, and if, you know, maybe you think it's increasingly realistic that at some point he cracks the rotation. Uh, do I think he can crack the rotation? Sure. Yeah, I think he, can, he could crack the rotation. But, you know, campaign throughout his career has been pretty durable, I think, uh, which is, you know, its own thing. You know, actually, I don't know. His, he had a weird year last year, but he, he played – uh, 78 games last year, played 48 the year before on the Suns. So I don't know what happened there exactly. 50 in the Suns before. So I guess not, I mean, he's definitely missed time. Um, I don't know. Like, it's just tough because the Knicks are not in a situation where they're like, they're good. Like they're, they're very good. They obviously are trying to win a championship. So that's their priority, right? Is everything should be about maximizing your ability to win the championship. Does unseating campaign and giving that to Tyler Kolek do that? I, I don't know. I'm a little bit skeptical because we know the learning curve for point guards coming from college into the NBA is steep. He's more experienced than most, which should help. Um, but there's like, you know, there's a lot of differences, right? The athleticism difference, all that type of stuff. His defense, I mean, his defense was a concern in summer league. Let's not even talk about what it what it could potentially be in the NBA. That was a concern, obviously, with him as a prospect even prior to Summer League or anything like that, right? This was like a well-known kind of concern everybody had about him was how would his defense hold up in the NBA. I think that's still very much an uh, open concern. The stuff he does well, though, is definitely like, look, the passing pops. He, he makes reads and hits guys in ways that nobody else in this team can, quite honestly. Um, I, I don't think that's debatable. He's probably... Already, I would say, one of the more creative passers in the league. Um, and that's like, you know, how useful of a skill that is and how, like, you can be one of the most creative. He could be like the, a top five creative passer in the league, right? I could say that. I want to be very clear, though. That does not mean he's a top five passer in the league because so much of passing comes down to, well, can you draw attention? Can you draw help to the ball can you draw eyes and enable your passing to be leveraged as a strength then right like we used to do this with frank where we're like oh frank's such a good pick and roll passer it's like cool dude but teams don't give a shit about his scoring ability so we can't really leverage that for anything i'm not, obviously i i think kolek is probably going to be a way better offensive player than frank was um so i'm not trying to draw that comparison directly i'm just kind of giving context to it um I think he's got a lot to prove. Like, again, the defense needs to come a long way. The three-point shooting, he went three of five, I believe, in this game. He made a couple pull-ups. That was really nice to see. But that's not something he's shown consistently <coughs> in his career to this point. So was it just a blip or was it nice? Like, I, I've seen people talk about, like, oh, my God, Ryan Dunn, he's shooting threes now, and he's he, he had 45% in two preseason games. And it's like, one, two preseason games. Two, preseason is not the real season and uh, it's all very different. So it's always important to remember that <clears throat> it's why I try to focus more on like the general process of things versus efficiency and, and all those type of things. Um, you know, we've seen RJ Barrett have great preseasons and then start a regular season off slowly. Same with Emmanuel quickly. <clears throat> it's not the same thing. And, and, Making shots in preseason doesn't mean you're going to start making shots in, in the regular season. So I think it's really, really important that fans don't immediately, like, you know, I, it's possible Kolek shows out throughout preseason, and then come game one, he's not even in uh, in the picture for the rotation. I think fans should probably give Tom Thibodeau the benefit of the doubt and and some, some grace there because, one, he's done a good job with most of the young talent we've brought through um, in developing them and introducing them, integrating them into the rotation of, over time. And then two, <clears throat> like, I just think there's a big gap between nice flashes against the third string Hornets guys versus, okay, you're ready to play real minutes against the top eight, nine guys in an NBA rotation. That's a that's a really big gap, and it's okay to bring him along slowly, even if he's a more 
ready prospect given his age. <clears throat> they also signed him to a four-year contract. So like, it's not like this is the last year of his contract and we have to prove it or something like that. Like he has time and, and the Knicks know that they didn't sign campaign to a multi-year deal, right? They signed him to a one-year deal. That to me tells you what they think. Hey, Cola, I think like all the reporting has been that they're very high on him internally and that they think he could be like, you know, he could play right now if need be, but they probably don't want to thrust him into that role, especially if like you always have to plan contingencies, right? So it would be stupid to come in, to come in and be like 100% chance that Kolek is ready to play. No contingencies in place. Let's go. And he comes in. And he, it, again, it's possible he comes in and is terrible. And then you're like, well, fuck. Now what do we do? Oh, now we're going to move Deuce back to back up point, which we know, or at least we knew last time we saw him, is not kind of his ideal role or what he thrives doing. So like, I think getting campaign was, okay, let's get this guy one, I'm assuming I, I want to. I'll, I'll get into it. I think they had an idea about this catch trade for a while. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident they have. Um, so I think that played a part in being able to sign campaign and and why they maybe wanted campaign. But two, I think it was like, hey, like we need contingencies. We need fail safes so that if so that we don't need to depend on Tyler Cola. And and guess what? If Tyler Cola comes in and when he gets opportunities, he actually is really good. Great. Like then, then we can play him over campaign, and who cares? Campaign's a veteran minimum on a one year one year deal, right? Like that's not like that. That's fine. You can bench a guy like that, and and then if he's not, then you still have campaign for the year. So it's it's a it's a smart move from the Knicks overall. I do not think Tyler Kolek is going to unseat campaign. While I would also agree with you that it's possible that he could do it. I just don't think it's very likely. Um, and I'm okay with that. He's going to get time though this season. Like we're going to have injuries. We're going to be shorthanded. I would be shocked if in those situations, Tyler Kolek doesn't get opportunities to play. Um, the fact that he even played in the game on Sunday, I think speaks well to how probably the coaching staff thinks about him because we saw even back in 2020, 2021, Emmanuel quickly didn't play the first preseason game at all. Like he didn't get in the game and that was a much worse team. Like the talent level was nowhere near this. You're not competing for championships. Like, so we already know that Tibbs is not just handing, even in the preseason, he is not just handing you out minutes. And I think it says something that he gave Kolek basically an entire quarter, I think a little bit more um, to play. And look, Kolek to your point, like I thought, he took advantage of that opportunity. He played well. That's all he can do. When he gets opportunities, he's got to play well. And if he does that consistently, then maybe he can take over for a campaign. But for as things stand right now, no, I, I would I would not expect that to occur. Definitely not to start the year. If it happened later in the year, I would be surprised. But that is more feasible to me than than anything immediate. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree. Um, I mean, yeah, especially on defense and just getting used to the speed of the game. Um, there's no need to rush it with Kolek. This isn't this isn't that season, right, where um, we clearly wanted to develop guards for the future. Um, and even then, to your point, Tibbs is, you know, he's going to, you know, he's going to make you earn it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do think he's, he's a very fun player. I, I like the potential chemistry with Deuce. I just, I like how all those guards fit with Deuce. Um, and I think, you know, I, th I think they will be fun to watch when Kolek gets in. I could totally see him to your point coming in in January when they're shorthanded, throwing a few assists and then the national media being like, why isn't this guy playing fucking Tibbs hates the kids, you know, you know uh, it'll also be us probably too. <laughs> Um, to be fair, yeah, but it'll be a lot. I mean, it'll be like you know, you get always the lines about Tibbs is a Grinch or whatever. <laughs> um, I think there's just a lot to like about this team, though. Um, so you know, I, I the, the backcourt, I think, for the bench could really be prolific because you have three high volume shooters there. Um, you know, Alan Hahn trotted out the champagne nickname. Um, their ShamWow could also be a nickname for uh, for Shamit. Um, but uh, I, I think didn't Han mention it like five times? Champagne, like, seems like he's really trying to make it a thing. So, champagne, yeah, as like the nickname for that backcourt. 
He he can certainly try. Someone said painful deuce, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, you know, I guess um, you know, beyond kind of the rotations, and again, knowing that for vets you have to take everything with a grain of salt. I'm not expecting to see a very serious Josh Hart performance until Boston, <laughs> to be flat out uh, honest about it. Um, but um, I'm curious, you know, what are you looking to see more of from, you know, from the preseason, from, you know, specific players or in general? You mentioned a few of the general things, but yeah. Uh, I mean, I would definitely like to see them get Mikal Bridges more integrated offensively. I thought he was kind of floating around, which normal, like, you kind of have to trickle down, right? Like Brunson and and Cat are going to be the priorities of figuring out how they work together, and then everybody else has to kind of fit in around that. I think it's easier for Josh Hart because he's just like, I'll go screen, I'll go offensive rebound, I'll, you know, whatever he does, he does all these things, right? So I think it's easier for him to figure that out. Mikael Bridges, look, we got to understand this guy has been the focal point of a team's offense for the last one and a half seasons. Going back from that or going from that back to kind of like his uh, his origin story uh, as a 3 and D peripheral wing, not a peripheral, but a, but a more of a tertiary piece is a little bit of an adjustment. Um, and he's a different player than Dante DiVincenzo, right? He's not just – Dante was fucking amazing in terms of his spacing and, and spotting up and all that stuff. Mikal Bridges is obviously a very competent and capable spot-up shooter – but I think he's also somebody who wants to cut, right? He is more of a natural cutter and finisher at the rim in a way that Dante isn't. Figuring that out, especially because we know OG is also a good cutter uh, and an active one, I think they have to figure out how to play off of each other. They have to figure out who wants to cut when, you know, who's spacing in what corner, who's going to be up top. Like all these type of small things, I think, are where he needs to kind of get reintegrated in. Uh, I, I don't really ever need to see another. Cal Bridges post up unless we desperately need it up against the shot clock. Um, that to me is not a weapon that we need to be developing uh, for any type of extended usage at this point. <clears throat> um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I just think he needs to get comfortable. And I know he's obviously has a lot of naturally should have natural chemistry with Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart, but he hasn't played with Carl Anthony Towns before. You know, he, he hasn't played with OG and Obi before. So, Kind of figuring out how to fit in. He also hasn't played all with that. Brunson and Hart in what? A Since few FIBA. Years? Yeah, he played with them oh. in FIBA. But but I mean that's also a different thing than Yeah, than and the, like the Villanova thing. thing, they're not gonna have great on court chemistry to start, right? Like that's kinda of just because they played in college, you know. Yeah, well not immediately anyway. Um but like yeah, I think he just has to figure that out, and that's okay. I'm not that worried about it. And, and you know, OG even talked about this. You know, he, he mentioned it in a quote, I forgot, might have been Christian Winfield that had it, uh, where he talked about, like, you know, tonight's not, not everybody is, like, it, it can be a different night for everybody, right? So, like, on one night, you might not be scoring anything, and then the next night, you're going to get 20, and then the other night, you know, somebody comes off the bench and gets 20. Like, that is the type of, aside from Brunson and Cat, I think there's going to be a lot of fluidity and kind of who is the third guy that steps up, the fourth guy, the fifth guy, whatever, and that might not be dictated by anything aside from like what how teams are defending you, right? So like, are teams comfortable letting Brunson and Cat kind of play two v two? Maybe uh, if that's the case, then yeah, expect those guys to have huge nights, and for everybody else to kind of have, be on the periphery. Are we going to see teams aggressively help off of Josh Hart to the like? You know, there's all kinds of ways that the teams are going to defend the Knicks. And figuring out where those weaknesses are, depending on the coverages, comes down to a lot of time on the court, decision making from your best players in terms of Brunson and Gat, um, and then figure, and then for other guys to figure out how to play off of that. So that's probably the only thing I'm interested in. Like I, I already know how OG fits on this team. We already know how Josh Hart fits on this team. Deuce McBride, whatever. Like McCall is the only person to me who's coming in and having to make like. A significant role adjustment so that's not just on him that's also on the coaching staff to help him um and his teammates you know like make it a point to get him going early in a game make it a point to hey like i'm going to get i'm going to get you a driving kick corner three right now 
make it a point to do those things. Um, I think they'll, I mean, they should get there. So I'm probably just saying this to say it, I guess, but yeah, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not very worried about it, but it is definitely something that needs to happen. But Macal Bridges is the, the major one for me. Yeah, and, and like I said before, there is like in this offense, because we generally tend to be not heliocentric, but very focused on the kind of um, the main one or two guys, right? Uh, even, you know, Randall's first season, you know, he was he was essentially pretty heliocentric. Being that two guard, being that off ball player, um, you know, you know, you do, you know, a guy like Reggie Bullock just played a very specific role. Um, you know, Obi Toppin would get lost in the offense. You know, we saw it with Grimes. He never really recovered. Uh, I do think it's a, as much on the player as on those players. Um, but, you know, like you said, Bridges has, you know, does a little bit more things. Do I necessarily want to see him post up? No, but he's effective at creating shots in the mid range, um, you know, off a drive, off a closeout. Um, he should be effective as a cutter. He had a nice cut that Cat found him on. Uh, I believe he either blew the layup or got he blew the layup, right? He didn't get blocked. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He 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 um he missed the reverse missed layup reverse. on like a nice. Yeah, yeah. By the way, Cat should have had like seven assists. Um, like Brunson missed a couple of bunnies off of Cat feeds. OG. OG. Um, I'll, I I was really impressed with that. Uh, yeah, I, th I think integrating Mikel as the newest face. Um. Kind of on that same note, I just want to get this out of the way. Um, I think Jake Fisher was talking about how OG is like less than thrilled or like about the Villanova triumvirate and like the attention they get. Um, and, you know, we know that OG wanted part one of his kind of issues with Toronto was wanting a larger role on offense. Um, I, I tend not to give too much credence to that. I mean, I'm sure like, like anyone else, right? If you're at work and you see like a few of your coworkers that are like getting a ton of attention, you're probably not going to like be overjoyed about that all the time. But that doesn't mean it causes any resentment. And on the second part, the thing is this, right? If I was OG in Toronto and I was like, I want to get paid. I, I think that to get my next contract, I need to show that I'm an on ball player. and I'm not getting the opportunity. That would seem to be more a reason to be a malcontent than, when you've just gotten the bag, you've gotten the bag that on ball creators get, and you're on that contract for five years, like showing you, you know, like you got the bag, right? So I don't know if you give more credence to that report or if it's any kind of concern to you, but um, for what it's worth, it seemed like OG was pretty good at picking his spots. He's, he's a good cutter. Um, he's comfortable taking that midi pull up. So he's not just kind of a standstill at the three point line guy. Obviously, he's comfortable taking threes. Um, but, um, so I, I think that's an easier fit and why I'd agree with you on uh, Mikel being kind of how you integrate him and get the most out of him being the bigger concern. But, um, curious if you saw that report and any thoughts on it. Um, no, I, I don't, I don't put any stock in that at all. To be honest, uh, I think it's bullshit. It doesn't even make sense. He was upset. So then they traded for Mikel Bridges and then he literally signed a day later. Like he agreed to terms a day later. No, like, I'm sorry. I, I don't buy that at all. It's ridiculous. And Like, come on. They they traded RJ Barrett and Manu quickly for him. Clearly, they valued <clears> – <throat> they already knew they were going to have to pay him. Um, there was already a report – we already knew there, report, there was reporting that Philly was in for him for however much money. Um, you know, no. I, I think that's all nonsense, and it's mostly just – a lot of it just feels like OG's new and he's a little bit aloof and, you know, he doesn't say much. And because of that, it's like easy to kind of assign these random things to him. Like, you know, when he was hurt last year, it was like, oh, does he, does he really care? Does he care? You know, or does he just want the bag? Like, I don't know. I think the guy cares, <clears throat> plays hard when he plays. You know, we have to manage his health, but I, I don't question his motivation. And honestly, who gives a fuck if he wanted more money? That's his prerogative. He should go get more money. Like he, he got it. So I don't I don't really see the issue with that. Um, that's how free agency works. That's how the basketball, that's how basketball business works, you know. Like it's that that's part and parcel of what it is. Um yeah, I, I don't I don't and like why I mean why would he think that Mikhail Bridges is coming to like take his spot? 
what logic would that like they so the Knicks made this huge trade for OG, who they clearly wanted to keep, and they were obviously talking uh contract with. And then they trade for McCall Bridges, so now all of a sudden he's like, Well, now they're gonna let me walk, or I mean, and, and also what would the logic be? They're, like, so I'm worried about my place with McCall Bridges, and I don't know they value me. So now that they traded for him, I'm gonna ask for more money. Like th- that if you are you're we're worried that they're gonna replace you, so then you ask for more money. Well, I mean, if you think about it, asking for money is generally considered a very irrational thing to do. So you need to come like, right? It's not like anyone would ask for more money if they could get it, right? It's it it has to be from this kind of a reason. Right. No, I mean it. it but the reason can't be. That, I'm like, being sarcastic. Yeah. Like he he asked for more money because that's what everyone does. Yeah. Right. Well, it it's also, but it's also like it, the the logic of like Macau being acquired. It, none of it it doesn't make sense. Why would that like why would he all of a sudden ask for more money because of that? If his if he wanted to be in New York, which is like kind of what that seems to indicate, then and he's worried that Macau is coming to replace him, then wouldn't he be like, actually I'm fine taking 35 million or whatever? Like it I think it's all bullshit. And I, I, I will say like <clears throat> I also think that I, I think it might make sense that the trade would have gotten him to ask for more money, but I think that makes sense to me from the standpoint of they're clearly all in if they traded for first yeah. pick. You better not let me walk now. You're trying to win, then yeah, I have you over the a barrel even more so because now if you lose me, it's not like you can pivot and get other ass. You you, you have a very limited. You can't lose me for nothing at this point, right? Yeah, so and I, and I just that, think but that's not a resentment thing or like no. I'm going to get replaced. It's just it's knowing that I'm even more valuable with Miguel yeah. here, and I and I think it's important for people to just like like OG taking what he did it did not stop them from anything it did not stop them from acquiring Mikael Bridges it did not stop them from ensuring that they were had space up to the second apron it did not stop them offering Isaiah Hartenstein his max that they were able to offer him it did not stop them from having the TPMLE Don't which you mean Isaiah Farton shit yes Isaiah Farton shit um a nickname I have coined in our great discord um like it, it did not stop them from having the taxpayer mid-level exception that they could have that they I think I'm pretty sure they tried to use on various centers throughout the summer. It didn't stop them from ultimately acquiring Carl Anthony Towns. Like it did not stop them from their goals or their ambitions. So at that point, I'm supposed like I just I, I, I even if it's true, who cares? Like it just doesn't matter to me. It does not matter to me um, because it didn't affect anything. The Knicks got the guys they wanted to get, and they had the opportunity to keep guys that they wanted to keep. Didn't affect any of it. So who cares? Um, <clears throat> I don't know what else. There was something else that you brought up for that. but uh, I no, The want... only other thing is, like, I think uh, OG, I'm a little less worried about him kind of fading. Yeah, I'm not worried about him at all. Like he he knows how to find offense without off ball. So yeah, and and like you know maybe um, maybe you know we've heard rumor we've we've heard rumors in the past that oh he wants to be more involved offensively and whatever. You could see the concern of like how are we going to blend you know Cat and Brunson and and Mikael Bridges and and OG and Anobi and keep him happy if he was going to be a free agent at the end of this year, but he's not, we just signed him. So at this point, I'm, I, I'm pretty confident. He kind of knows what his role is going to be. And, and he's, he's been, he's been compensated, right? It's not yeah, like exactly yeah, in he's Toronto. Paid. He's looking at free agency. He's like, people just think I'm a three and D guy. And we get paid like a three and D guy. You didn't get paid like a three and D guy. You got paid like a star. So now be happy to be a star in your role, right? You, you no longer have to show that or demonstrate that the same way. And for yeah, what you locked in your money. He has some rough creation possessions too. Um, he, I love the midi pull up. I think he's great at straight line. Um, but when he's dribbling in traffic, uh, I don't think the handle is there. I mean, when he, he, looks almost un- the ball. he moves so well on defense, and then it's just when he has the ball in traffic on offense. Like I don't know if it's his feet or whatever, but um, you know, in a straight line or you know, he's smooth on the pull up. He's great at those things. But um, I, I think I think it starts with the handle. Like he, he just loses his coordination because he's focused so much on dribbling the ball. So, and I think he's probably I don't think he's going to be pushing for for more ISO right um, when he's. I mean, he knows they're trying to win a championship. So, 
Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. His his dribbling definitely leaves much to be desired. Uh, <clears throat> I think it is worth uh, discussing. We had a little argument, a debate, a conversation uh, earlier uh, a few days ago in the Discord. Obviously, Julius Randle has been traded. He is gone. He spent five years with the Knicks, uh, three All-Star appearances, two All-NBA berths, two playoff appearances, one in – I mean, neither in which he was particularly good, but one and obviously they win a playoff series uh, against Cleveland in 2023. He looked well on his way this season to obviously not just being a part of another Knicks playoff run, um, but also another all NBA berth. He did make another all star team this year. You know, the 2000s of Knicks history has not been great, has not been a wonderful time, has not been littered with uh, a number of high level, all star level players for the Knicks. So it's notable when somebody produces what Julius Randle did. Um, I don't. I I don't think like you know, one. I think Brunson is pretty clearly the best Nick of this millennium. I guess we could put it um, since two thousand. Whatever. Like I I don't even think it's de- it's not debatable. It, it's not close. He is the best Nick in that time. What um, about Marbury, Mello, Jamal Crawford. Yeah, well, uh, we'll get to Mello, uh, who's definitely a player. Marbury wouldn't even get a mention. You never bought the Starberry sneakers from Stephen Berry's? I did buy his very cheap sneakers that were good. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think Brunson's pretty unequivocally the best. And even if you don't, uh, the only like to me, there's a clear top three, and I don't, I don't know how there could be much debate about it. Again, this is just from 2000, but. It's Brunson, it's Randall, and it's Carmelo Anthony. And I, I don't, I don't know that that should be controversial to anybody. In that order, not to me. But uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, I Brunson, just think, Randall, and then Melo. So would that be your order? I will get to my order. Oh, uh, but I think that, like, I, I don't know. I, I just find I find it weird that, like, I I get that, and I'm not like in my heart of hearts. I was, I thought, yes, this version of the team, especially, I want to be very specific, last year's version of the team before he got hurt. I was like, this is the best chance Julius Randle has to like prove to us and prove to everybody that he's not just this playoff shitter and he can pr- produce there and be valuable. Obviously, he doesn't get that opportunity and will not get that opportunity in New York, um, barring some crazy reunion down the line. But like, I, you know, so part of me understands that even while I thought that, I was in the in the back of my head. I'm like, do I really believe that he's going to do it though? Like, am I sure? Am I confident? And and it's also why, like, you know, when you're talking about an extension for him, like, you know, we talked about it on here multiple times before, obviously before the trade. Where I was kind of like, I'm fine just playing this out and seeing because I don't know you want to tie yourself to any type of extension for a player with his playoff track record before you've seen it before. before, Can we just see you play well in the playoffs then? And then I'm happy to pay you. Then I'll pay you, but that's a big risk you're taking. So in my, you know, now, like, do I feel like I'm happy that worrying about the Julius Randle playoff performance stuff is not our concern at this point. Not to say cat is perfect. We know he has his own flaws, but Cat's proven a lot more in the postseason for sure than Julius Randle has. Like, obviously, not even. I mean, there's no comparison really in their playoff resumes. So, I get that, and I don't think it's debatable that Melo was an absolute better player than Julius Randle. Like, that's not really debatable to me. I think that's clear. Melo was, you know, he was a better primary guy even with his limitations as a playmaker than julius randall but i do personally this is me i'm i'm sure i'm in the minority i think randall is a greater nick than carmelo anthony was um i think the circumstances in which both arrived are relevant to me 
one guy signed in free agency. Obviously, he did not come with the same fanfare or adulation that Carmelo Anthony did. One guy forced his way here in trade because he had to get an extension before uh, the lockout because, you know, got, got to get that done. And a lot of that, you know, one guy, one guy turned us around from a joke. The other guy kind of, kind of fleetingly did, I guess, in, in a way that was just not as sustainable or fun. I think Randall has overcome more adversity in his time here in terms of like one, his initial perception, like our, the, our Knicks fans' initial perception of this guy was this bumbling fool who kept spinning around in the paint under one of the, probably the worst coach in franchise history in David Fisdale. And that was our first impression of him. So that clouded kind of everybody's feelings about him initially. You know, we went, we're talking about a guy that most of us would have been like, yeah, Look, if you can trade him for Nick Batum in a couple seconds or whatever, prior to his second season, most I think most Knicks fans would have done that. Instead, he comes in as an all all star All NBA season. He overcomes that, leads the Knicks to the the playoffs for the first time in what eight years at that time, um, and he does it with a lineup which and and a quite frankly a roster which I think we would both say had no business actually finishing fourth in the conference that year. Um, and, you know, he does that. And then, you know, obviously he has a terrible 2021-22, horrific, uh, a season that made me spend an entire offseason <clears throat> trying to concoct trades and and ways to unload his contract. But, um, you know, he stays, and then he has another bounce back here. He makes an all-star, makes an all-NBA team, gets hurt for the playoffs, and then he struggles in the playoffs. Fits and then again, pretty seamlessly with a new star acquisition. I, we should we should add that right that that to his credit yeah. the fact that Jalen came in and there wasn't people were I mean I would have been worried right if I knew Jalen was going to have that kind of usage like how is Randall going to handle that right he's used to having the ball in his hands I'm not saying that Randall like turned into this super off ball player or something but he facilitated and and Jalen Brunson you know is so good at getting his own shot there's people who believe that the catch and shoot thing doesn't matter but it's worth noting that. Randall was good at creating those opportunities, which Jalen is really efficient on, on for him. And he didn't seem to, you know, there are, you know, he didn't seem to get his ego hurt or anything when Jalen really became the star. If anything, I think he kind of embraced that. So, yeah, I mean, they, they fit fine together. There was, look, if there was any issues with them, you know, in terms of how that all played out, we didn't ever hear about that publicly. There was nothing about that publicly. And, I'll just, I, I don't think that was ever, uh, I think Carmelo needed to be the main guy. There was several pieces of evidence pointing to that. Um, whatever, sticking to Randall. But yeah, and then this last year, I thought he was playing the best ball of his career. I thought he was playing the best ball as a Nick, especially right when he got hurt that month. I thought he was fantastic um, in terms of kind of like balancing his scoring, but also looking for others, the team environment improving with OG being acquired in Hartenstein turning at center certainly helped him, but you know, he, I just think he overcame a lot and he played through injuries. You know, he was, he, he battled through a lot of stuff to be on the floor. It was not always beautiful. It was not always great. We, we all know about the thumbs down. We know about yelling at teammates and, and all kinds of variety of things. But overall, I just think that he delivered a lot and overcame a lot of skepticism, both from, I mean, you got to remember, this is a guy who was clowned basically as like, oh my God, this is your star free agent signing in 2019. Ha ha ha. And LOL Knicks. And like you mentioned this on the, uh, the last part we did, but like he might have ended up being the best free agent signing in that entire summer, if you look at it in hindsight. So like, at least in terms of what he delivered to the team that signed him. So I don't know for me, if I'm ranking them as like players. Yeah. I mean, Mel is ahead of Randall, but in terms of guys that I think really brought something to the franchise and, and who I appreciate for in terms of like what they gave us and their commitment to us and all that shit um, during their time as Knicks. Like, yeah, I would have Randall above Mello. And I, I don't feel like, that's really shade on mellow. I mean, I could shade mellow if I want to. Trust me, I'll do it. Have you ever shaded mellow before? Never. Uh, never. Uh, my favorite player. Um, no, I mean, look, like I, 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 I definitely shade mellow, and I, 
yeah, if you want to say management fucked him, sure, management fucked him. I don't think there's any question about that. But you know what? He chose to come here when we had shitty management, and he chose to come here in the most inefficient way possible that always made it harder for us to actually put the necessary talent around him to truly contend. And I don't... I, I'm i sorry. I think it's bullshit to use the front office dysfunction, incompetence, organizational dysfunction, incompetence as an argument to defend him for team underachievement during his time here when he chose that. Like, he chose that. So he knew what he was getting into. And if you know what you're getting into, then I'm sorry. I, I won't give you a pass for that. And I, I think it's I think it's fair to hold his underachievement as a leader against him. This is a guy that didn't want to lead. He did not want to lead. And I don't know if Julius Randle wanted to lead. I don't even know if he was the best leader. He was not the best leader. I think Brunson helped him in a lot of ways coming here and kind of being able to take some of that burden from him. But I think Julius Randle tried his best. I think he really, really tried his best. I think the young guys like RJ and Quickly and you know even Grimes and other guys they've all talked about like you know how Randall kind of you know Big Brother all that type of stuff. So he tried his best, and, and like you know I'm not saying I don't think Melo was a bad teammate either. I think Melo was a fine teammate. I, to my knowledge, most everybody that's played with Melo has liked playing with him. So. I, I I don't I don't really buy that he's a bad teammate, but I do think that he's a bad leader. Um, or not he he just didn't want to lead. He just didn't do it. It's not his thing. Um, and if you're gonna be the franchise guy and you're gonna take all this stuff and force your way here, and you know you, you can't get all the bells and whistles without kind of doing the thing that you that is expected of that player. You know, LeBron James went to LA incompetent dysfunctional organization when he's went to the Lakers and won them a championship and unequivocally is a leader in all ways. Now, obviously Carmelo Anthony is not LeBron James as a player, um, but he just also never lived up to the kind of billing that, that came with his acquisition. And maybe that's unfair to hold kind of the expectation against him. But I do. I'm not going to lie. I do, I do hold that against him because of how he forced his way here. Whereas Julius Randle came here, I would say, I don't even know what the opposite of fanfare is. Like the basically he came here and was mocked and ridiculed effectively by everybody, um, including Knicks fans initially for sure. And at various points throughout his time, he was mocked by Knicks fans, myself included. But I have, so I have an appreciation for somebody who kind of overcame all that in the way he did and and helped turn this thing around in a way that feels a lot more sustainable than a couple of playoff seasons with Melo did. Um, so, you know, is that fair? I, I don't know. But I definitely have, you know, the fucking conversation that drives me nuts is like, should Melo's number be retired? And it's like, for what? We're, we're retiring the guy's number for a playoff series win? That's what we're doing now. Like that's that's the standard. Like to me, that's crazy. Um, this isn't football. This isn't the NHL. Like this isn't Major League Baseball. Y you don't. If you don't deliver playoff success at some point, it just says something about you and your limitations as a player. Um, and one playoff series win for everything we gave up to get him and all the resources that were put into trying to kind of put that team together whether that was done competently or not. Yeah, that's not good enough. And all of that is to say for me, like I put, yeah, I, I put Randall above Mello as a great Nick, even if I will always accept and do accept that Mello was definitely the better player. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I think that what you said about Randall, I generally agree with. Um, I think as much as Carmelo did struggle in the playoffs, he was the best player um, in a Knicks series win. Um, Randall cannot say that. Um, Melo was inefficient in the playoffs. He was, in that sense, a playoff dropper, but he was averaging high 20s. Randall was both low scoring and low efficiency. 
So as, in terms of playoff players, there was a palpable difference. Um, I do think, you know, if you were to do an alternate, so, you, you know, you I, might I will say this, Carmelo Anthony has, he played, like we talk about, you know, Randall's horrific playoff games. Carmelo Anthony played one of the worst playoff games I've ever watched in my entire fucking life. When we had the chance to sweep the Celtics. I, I'm pulling up the box score because I will never forget this game. It is like honestly mind boggling to me the numbers you put up. Uh, hold up one second. Where's this? At? Here, you keep talking. I'll, I'll pull up the numbers. But I mean, to that point, he's also had several playoff games where he did shine, right? I don't think Randall, like game one against Cleveland, I thought his process was good, but he still went seven for 20 with 19 points, right? Now, I think we both said after that game, that's not a game where you look at the stats. It's an elite defense. And Brunson was in foul trouble. They needed him. He did what they needed him to do. But I, I think in terms of playoff performance, Melo's highs were a lot higher. Uh, even all though right, to so your point, he has some bad lows. And we're going to hear one. All right. Uh, this is a 97-90 win for the Celtics that goes into overtime. Um, in overtime, Carmelo Anthony goes 1-4 of four for four points. He also has... Uh, no, sorry. He had a foul. Whatever. But... This is the part that I want to read. This is the for the game. This is for the game. Carmelo Anthony, 10 of 35 from the field, 36 points, seven rebounds, seven turnovers, two assists, of seven from three. Uh, he went 16 of 20 from the free throw line, which saved him. Uh, the rest of the team on this night shot 21 of. Uh, 55 or yeah, 21 of 55. Uh, like they're, they, I mean, it's not like a great offensive performance from the team, but I cannot stress to you watching this game, how infuriating it was because he basically just decided he needed to like be the guy to win this game. It was a terrific game. Uh, one of the worst I've seen. Randall has had several. I mean, that entire series against Atlanta was definitely something. Yeah, and Melo kind of had to be the guy. Um, when Randall had to be the guy, we had the Atlanta series. Even playing next to perhaps the best playoff Nick since certainly this millennium, right? He got to play next to the best Nick that's played this millennium and still struggled. Um, I can argue, you know, there were things that didn't work to Randall's benefit with team construction as well. He was never a great fit with RJ Barrett. Uh, probably wasn't a great fit with, with Mitchell Robinson, but. You know, Melo played with it with a center like that as well, um, who was dog shit in that Indiana series. But as I'm sure you will, <laughs> you, you would agree, right? Um, so you know, I think that that playoff difference does matter to me. Um, I would also pose an alternate alternate thought experiment: if Randall was signed, let's say Randall signs in free agency to that Donnie Walsh front front office, um, and Mellow signs with this front office, right? With Leon Rose. Do you think their careers, Mellow would have had more success as a Nick and Randall would have had less success as a Nick? Yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's not even a question. But like, again, Carmelo chose that. That's what he, and he, he I mean, if we're going to be real, like he kind of. But he didn't choose all of it, right? For example, he did not tell them to sign Amari Stoudemire. But he already knew that. He, he, he already he, knew that when he forced his trade here. He already knew they'd signed Amari Stoudemire. So he already knew that like this thing existed, that this major risk, injury risk on the team existed. He didn't care. Still wanted to come. So I guess the other distinction I'm I think you kind of said this, but just to be clear, you do think better, not just better player overall, but you're saying as a Nick, you would concede that Mello was a better Nick than Randall. His play was better. Like his highs were definitely better. Yes. Yeah. So I think that um, I think it's fair to say, look. Sports is you know how can you not be emotional about baseball? How can you not be emotional about sports? Right. That's that absolutely. I don't think it's unfair to to attach that to Melo. I do think he was the victim of biased coverage. Um, I think Randall has come in a little bit more polished in as you know in terms of being able to handle the media. He's had the relationship with Leon Rose. Um, hasn't always been at the best. To be don't get me wrong. But Mello was kind of came into the. You, you have to remember when Mello came in, 
this is still like 2003. This is still when guys who had cornrows were looked at the way Iverson was looked at, right? Um, and I thought, you know, given where he came from and everything, he received a lot of negative coverage that followed him to New York. I don't think, I think Phil Jackson poured fuel on that fire. Um, so I think, you know, when people shit on Mello, um, you know, I, I've heard a lot of, you know, not from you, I'm obviously wouldn't, I'm not accusing you of this. I've heard a lot of coded criticisms from Mello. And I think it's fair to point out that people who really go to bat for him are responding in some ways to those criticisms, right? It's one thing to say, the guy just wasn't as good as LeBron James, even though he's the same draft class and was thought to have that level of talent. It's another thing to say he's selfish. It's another thing to use other words that he's been called, right? Um, it's another thing. To, it's one thing to say he's not a great leader. Not everyone is meant to be one. Um, it's another thing, again, to, people have called him a self, call him selfish. People, so I, I think that that's where a lot of, but I, I think to be fair, um, you know, I, I think a lot of that was exaggerated and mellow and the media was, I think the, the front office was a lot worse than this one, not only at kind of managing the team, but things like leaks and, um, and, you know, and, and manage and controlling the press, really, that sounds really bad. And, <laughs> um, but what I mean is just no, controlling the way they get presented, Protect, protecting your player, protecting controlling your the press is... sounds like some Elon Musk. No, so I didn't protecting <laughs> your, protecting your players is, is definitely important having like. You know, I mean, look, they, the fact is, forget a fucking, like, the, the, there was no presence from the front office. Like, people can say whatever they want about, oh, Leon doesn't talk to the press or whatever. But, like, do you really, like, he's at every fucking game. Like, he clearly has a presence within the organization that Donnie Walsh did not have, that Grunwald did not have, that, you know, whoever, Phil Jackson, like, not, and amazing that Phil Jackson, Phil Jackson did probably have that presence. He was just a fucking terrible GM. And they would sabotage their players, right? The internal politics. Yeah. The most you hear in terms of internal politics, maybe somebody doesn't like OG or didn't like what he asked for, so let that leak to Chick Fisher, right? These are the kind of, it is, um, so my, my point is that the way Carmelo is perceived as a person does bother me. Um, and that's why, you know, I do try to keep the focus on how we played as a player, which is why I still probably would put him over Randall. Um, but I, I don't think it's unfair to say, um, I think it's, you know, I think it's fine to say like, look, he wanted his money. I don't blame anyone for wanting their money. Right. Um, and the, you know, it, it wasn't the, the easiest situation because, you know, he didn't really have the freedom to play where he wants, which, you know, kind of sucks, you know, when people, when a, a worker doesn't have the freedom to play where they want, but, um, you know, I think when you look, I do think it's not unfair to say Randall came here when really nobody wanted to. People said about Mello, but it was like, well, he got paid more than he would have. You could say that about Randall, but it was, you know, Mello also instigated that trade. So it's not just that he came here of his own volition when nobody wanted to come here. He demanded a trade. Um, Randall signed here as a free agent, right? Um I one could argue actually that Randall came here when the Knicks were even worse. They were coming off. I don't know, think it's debatable. They were worse. They, were they worse. had just gotten to third. Uh, or sorry, no, his first year they were bad, but they were they were worse than when Mello came here. The, the season Mello came, they had won seventeen the game. They had the worst record in the NBA the year before. Wasn't seventeen there. games the one when Randall did sign? No, he signed the he signed Randall's first year was also Arya's rookie year, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that was, they won 17 years of the games. I mean, when Melo came here, the Knicks were pushing for an eight seed. They were, you know, a fun new team. He also, he should have been familiar with the coach and that he was not a very good fit for the coach's style. Um, and so I think it's totally fair to say Randall really came to the Knicks at their lowest point. Uh, and I mean, yeah, like if you're talking about emotions and all that around it, at the time, like Melo came in with like, again, not his fault, but the guys he replaced, homegrown Knicks and Gallinari, a guy who is really starting to live up to his potential on a fun up and down team. And he's kind of bringing a very different style to that. Um, Mel, uh, Randall is coming in to a team that has had a thousand think pieces from Howard Beck about how they're fucking awful fans and they should go and root for the Nets. Um, he's coming in again after that KD summer, after they missed on Zion. Um, after they've just been relentlessly, you know, first ESPN plays up these signing rumors, then they say, oh my God, Knicks fans really thought they're going to get KD. He, ca he came in and for that season, he pulled us out of that. Um, was he perfect? No, but no star is. I mean, you're, the, the kind the, the kind of stars who, you know, if you, you that Randall is clearly not, and, and Mello wasn't, are the kind of stars that, you know, come in 
Average 27, 24 and six their first year, got even better in the playoffs. Their second year end up in, in <laughs> MVP conversations and look basically superhuman in the playoffs, even playing 44 minutes a night. Those kind of guys are in just a different conversation. Anything short of that, though, Randall, you know, it's fine to be a fan of him. And it's, you know, we've kind of probably debated a lot of people that probably were too much in on Randall, right? That wouldn't see his flaws. But I also get that just because of, of how much he meant. I think Melo meant a lot of the same things to a lot of people. Um, so it's going to be subjective and fandom is, but, um, but I, I would agree. I think that if you're ranking them as players on the floor on the Knicks, you'd have to put Mel over Randall well, Brunson pretty far above both. I think there's still people who put Mel over Brunson, which I just completely disagree with. Forget that. I get that Mello was in an era where efficiency wasn't prized as much. Um, I just think, uh, <laughs> Brunson is he's a better scorer. He's more dynamic scorer. He's a better passer. If Melo was a good defender, really lived up to his potential, that might have been a, a conversation. But uh, it's Brunson. Um, he's been the best player in two playoff series wins. Um, has ha- carried the offense when he's needed to. Has played off stars when he needed to. Um, but you know, if you want to put Randall, just you know, your view of him or like how much he meant to the Knicks in a larger than basketball sense, I could get that ranking. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I think I, I just hold all the other stuff against Carmelo more than a lot of others do. Like I don't give him a pass because the front office was incompetent because he chose to come here. I don't give him a pass. I don't think it's like, yeah, Amari getting hurt sucks. Guess what? Like, we all kind of knew he was an injury prone guy, and you were comfortable with that risk when you forced your way here. You forced your way here in a way that hurt the ability to put more talent around you. Um, you know, happening um yeah so i i I, all that stuff is part of it like i i I talked about the leadership thing and he just to me like he didn't recruit who did he recruit he never recruited he never tried to like go out of his way to recruit players he never went out of his way to really like draw talent and i don't know like is again I, i don't know if that's all fair i'm I'm like open to the idea I'm unfair to Carmelo Anthony, but I, I don't, I don't think it's like that outrageous. Like, you know, I, I, there's, there's so much nonsense that went on during that time. Not all of it about him. I mean, in fairness to Carmelo, I think that he was, at least by the time he was in New York, he was a pretty professional player. Um, I don't, he didn't have any, I mean, his off court transgressions were not of the, um, criminal variety uh they happen more of the marital variety uh so that is not an issue for me as a basketball Wait. fan he called us face what's up he called someone a glazed donut ass face that was awesome. yeah that's also just funny i mean who cares about that but like <laughs> he like he i don't have it i i never took issue with him off the floor i think he was fine and i think whatever i, I will I don't both think should be commended, was... by the way. Both were, did a lot for the community, right? There's, you know, yeah. Randall oh, yeah, was yeah, opening yeah. a school. You know, in that sense, they were both good, uh, you know, athletes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think even though I don't think he was a particularly good leader, again, like I think he was a good teammate. Like his teammates didn't have an issue with him. They all seemed to universally like, like, as enjoyed playing with him. Um, so all that's fine, but like, you know, all the like, I don't think it's just a one way street between the stuff with him and the front office. Like, I'm sorry, like the stuff with Phil Jackson, I don't think that was just a one way street. I don't think Mello was <clears throat> like, I don't think Phil is a good partner. I don't think Mello is a good partner. I don't think they mixed at all. And I don't think either of them ever tried to really bridge the divide once there was one. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> he, and it wasn't the last time he would 
clash with a, a front officer coach, right? So yeah, like he he I mean he had an issue with D'Antoni, right? D'Antoni wanted him to take more threes. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to play the four. Like he the the Knicks kind of fluked into him playing the four because of injuries. But when they were healthy, that he never played the four because he didn't want to play the four. Um, in some ways, it's almost like fortunate for him, not maybe for him, but like for the team that Car- that Amari was hurt for so much of their time together because they were always better when Melo was at the four and Amari wasn't available. Um, like it was just, it was never, it was never good. And he was never willing to just accept what was best for the team. And even like getting him to shoot more threes, right? I mean, he did it for Woodson finally, but he wouldn't do it for, for Mike D'Antoni and that getting buy-in is part of the coach's job. So you can put that on, on D'Antoni and I, I would, but to not understand that either and to not be kind of willing to until a different coach comes in is definitely very frustrating. Um, and it's not like MDA, you know, it's not like D'Antoni had a bunch of issues getting other guys to kind of adhere to his preferred offensive principles in terms of spacing and taking a lot of threes and shit throughout his career. And he coached a variety of different ways, right? Like he didn't, <clears throat> he didn't coach Houston the same way he coached the Suns. Right, like they were different teams. They play different, even if their shot profiles and what they wanted were similar. So it just it just all speaks to me of like a, a guy who I don't want to say undermined, but <clears throat> I would say you wielded his influence in ways that were better for him personally than they were for the team. Um, and look, Randall probably never had that type of influence because he just was never that type of figure in in and around the, the NBA landscape. Uh, but that kind of works to his benefit. Again, I if, you, if somebody tells me Melo is their favorite Nick and they obviously he's better than than Julius and whatever, I, that's clearly not the – probably the, it's the majority opinion and definitely not an insane one. Um, I just value kind of like the stability that we've established during Randall's tenure. And that's not just down to him. <laughs> but he was a key building block towards it. And I'll remember his years with the team more fondly than I remember Melo's years. Like I remember one season of Carmelo Anthony really fondly. And that's it. There are like multiple seasons from the Knicks with Julius Randle that I remember fondly. And as a fan, that's what matters to me more than, and, and, and I'm speaking strictly in terms of evaluating these guys as Knicks. Um, that's what matters to me more than, than who hit the higher highs individually. Like I, I value John Starks more as a Nick than Carmelo Anthony, right? Like not because he was, he definitely wasn't as good of a player as Carmelo, but he was part of something and he, he sacrificed and put his body in line and all those things that you can talk about. But like, that is part of it to me. Like, it's like, I think that greatness as a, in terms of, franchise icons is different to me than ranking players. Like I think Kobe is a greater Laker than Shaq. Do I think Kobe is better than Shaq? No. Do I think that Kobe was better than Magic Johnson? No. Do I think Kobe is better than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? No. But like, I think he's the greatest Laker because I think it matters that he was with the team for as long as he was. And he only played for the team and blah, blah, blah. Like that is all part of it. Winning time didn't convert you. No, winning time, the, uh, the short-lived winning time did not convert me. But I think all that, like, that stuff is all part of, like, franchise iconography, right? Like, you can have somebody who is not, like, I'm trying to think of an example um, of, like, sports where, well, like, I don't Jeter? know. Yeah, J- Jeter is, like, the all-time Yankee. Is he the actually the best player to play for the Yankees? No. Like, definitely not. But, I would say he wasn't even the best player on those teams, but but well, two, yeah, and I mean, he's probably the most iconic. Yeah, and I think that as Yankee, like this is like, and this is a thing that I always find stupid, um, even as like a very casual Yankees fan, is like people that are not Yankees fans being like, well, he wasn't even the best Yankee. Like you guys overrate him, and it's like, yeah, but like that's just like not the thing. Like it's it's like he was the captain, and he like like there's something about what he stood for that transcends like, and it's not, you're not just kind of valuing him for what he was as a player, which is still a really fucking good player, but like it represents something more. I don't know. It's kind of corny and cheesy, but especially when you're talking about sports, when players move around so much, but there's something to that. And like, it's why like, you know, Dirk 
Dirk kind of, he has a legacy with a franchise in a way that Kevin Durant doesn't, even though I would say that I think the majority of people would tell you Kevin Durant's the greater player individually than Dirk Nowitzki. But like Dirk has a standing with the Mavericks that Durant doesn't have with any franchise, right? He's not the all-time Thunder guy. He's not the all-time Warriors guy. He's not going to be the all-time Suns guy. Like, he's, I mean, I guess he might be the all-time Nets guy, so he's got that going for him. Um, Come on, respect Dr. J. Yeah, Dr. J and Brooke Lopez. Um, <laughs> but, like, I don't know. I, I think that stuff is different. It's like Dwayne Wade, right? I mean, Dwayne, I, mean I guess Dwayne Wade's – you know, Dwayne Wade is a perfect example. He played with LeBron. LeBron was at his peak in Miami. LeBron was the best players on those teams when they titled. But do you think the average Heat fan is like, who's the best Heat player ever? I think they're all like, yeah, it's weird. Shaq. Yeah. Sean yeah. Leonard, Alonzo yeah. Moore. Um, actually, Tim Hardaway Jr., the, the killer crossover. You mean senior? <laughs> oh, yeah, senior, yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I think that you're. I think that's hitting the nail on the head. I do think LeBron is probably beloved in Cleveland just because of how championship starved they was. They were, although obviously we know that. that that's that's also just like its own weird, unique – yeah thing, right um but I, I do think you know i i i am for freedom of player movement um oh yeah, yeah I, i'm not it's but to your point there is something about like this is our guy and we're against the world whatever you wanted to say about randall and sometimes maybe he took that too much to heart um he was like that was our guy <laughs> and i think that's what makes brunson as beloved as as he is that's why people fondly remember Pat, despite a lot of criticism, despite coming up short sometimes in big moments, getting outplayed by, you know, Akeem, those kind of things. It's something when it's your guy and they, and that's what we're, that's what we're seeing now with Brunson, where we just came off a season where he's doing things that few have done before. And he's still, you know, is he big enough to be a 1A? He's still getting these kind of criticisms. It ties you, I think, to a player in a certain way. Um, and, you know, add on that, you know, in the way and changing the culture and all of those things and, and t turning around an embarrassment into, you know, a winner. Um, you know, I think most of the guys you're talking about did that, right? Dallas had been more abundant and they became a consistent winner. And eventually, and Dirk dealt with some of the same, not the same criticisms. Dirk was criticized for being soft, right? It's another European player. When you kind of see someone overcome that, um, and, and I think we're watching that with Brunson now. It, it ties you to a player, I think, in just a different way. Kobe was the same thing, right? He had that playoff series where he had four different air balls. Um, probably one of the more polarizing stars, right? When you see that guy, you know, win championships, it's going to mean a little bit different than a guy who came over in free agency, you know, probably didn't commit himself 100% of the same time the same way in, in Shaq. Um, so I think that's it's a worthwhile convo. I try to keep it more about, you know, what happens on the court because again a lot of that can get colored by not great press coverage or irresponsible press coverage but um but as fans it's, it's tough to pretend that we don't think about those things as well right yeah yeah it's just yeah, it's it's sports is obviously not like the most rational thing so it's a very emotional thing and um i don't know for whatever reason carmelo's time has really soured on me probably a little more in hindsight than I was at the time I was a hundred percent like an apologist, but I think as you get removed from that, I mean, by the time, like his last year in New York, I was so fucking over it. I was so over it. I was just like enough with this guy. He, he's just, he, he, I, to me, he just completely mailed it in that year other than whenever he touched the ball. It was also, and it's not just all on him. Like that entire team was, obviously poorly put together in terms of Rose and Noah and Courtney Lee and Kristaps is there still. It's this weird. They really thing. underrated how much Robin Lopez meant on that team. Um, and uh, I think that was kind of the most annoying thing because I really liked how he fit on that team. Um, I will, here's a, here's a commonality between Randall and Mello. Are you ready for this? Oh God, here we go. When both were traded from the Knicks, they were traded for, it is not official yet but a person who would start at center for the Knicks the following season. Or not not the following season, but I think yeah. Mitch, did, Mitch did start the following season, right? He start, I'm sure he had a couple of starts, but he was not the starter, I don't think. So the the last two, yeah, so the last two, uh, so they one got traded for Mitch, one got traded for Cavs. So interesting coincidence there. 
Yeah. I will like the the jersey retirement stuff with Melo's would really drives me nuts more than anything. I'm just like, come on. I just I, I I don't care. And I think he's so shameless. I think he's so shamelessly trying to like campaign forward and like kind of push and nudge his way into there. And it's like, get out of here, dude. I'm not I don't want it. I don't want this. I want I want I fucking cat should have taken seven as far as I'm concerned. Oh, bold. <laughs> he's trying to teach how to trigger some people, so <laughs> that'd have been really funny. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, I'm home. Make it up for me. Yeah, make the I'm coming home video as well. <laughs> Just we paste this picture on. They called me Little New York. Nobody fucking called you Little New York, dude. Get the fuck out of here. Do you think um do you think they will do something at preseason for Cat? Like a welcome to New York, or do you think that'll be regular season home opener or I don't think they'll do like a welcome thing. I, I think they did they did that thing. They had an event last night, right? It's, it's probably what it is. Like I think that was I, I don't think they like to make great fanfare of their own guys kind of during the season. Um, but I, I, they'll definitely do something for Julius and, and Dante and those guys deserve it. Um, Dante only played a year, obviously here, but he was really good for the Knicks <clears throat> and had a huge, you know, a couple of huge playoff moments for us. Randall, I mean, we just talked about it extensively, but just in general, like I've seen so many people kind of celebrating that he's gone. And while I understand that because I was not, exactly again deep down in my heart i was not like oh, man, i'm so excited to like commit the next four years to julius randall on the knicks um it's a bit much when i've seen people like kind of be dismissive of of what he provided and what he did and and his production here um you know and again even like again like like with mellow whatever randall's issues were they're pretty strictly like on the court issues basketball issues they were never like you were never worried about this guy off the court. You know, he conducted himself well as a Nick. He think he represented the city uh, well, and he seemed to embrace the city. Obviously, now he's doing his whole, like, actually, Minnesota is great. I love it here. The food is fantastic. We're oh, country God. folks. <laughs> yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. Oh, this is just like Texas, except cold. Uh, so I, I get that he's got, that's what he's got to do. Uh, I do worry for him in terms of I don't think he's long for Minnesota and I don't think they plan on rotating him. Maybe he'll play himself into there. Maybe he'll do what he did with us where we were like, oh, man, we got to trade this guy. And then he just comes out. And he's like, what if I'm an all-star, though? You're like, fuck. This changes everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, they're not going to let him walk for nothing. I do. I, I do feel like I could definitely see him going back to Texas, but not Dallas. So. Oh yeah, Houston, no. San Antonio. The one with a stretch five. <laughs> oh, you don't think Jabari's a good stretch five? No. Uh, is he a five? Really? <laughs> they used him at the five when Shingun was out last year. Yeah. Um, I, 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 they are sold on Shingun, and they're not. That that does not seem like a good fit with Randall. But I, I actually would really like it. You have a center who could both protect him at an all defensive level and uh, space the floor. So. Um, yeah. <clears throat> All right, Stacey. Uh, we did it. We podcasted. It was a great time. Let's be where they can find you and uh, plug anything that you like to plug. Uh, you find me at Stacey Patton 89 and um, yeah, nothing to plug. Awesome. Uh, I'd like to plug personally, so I'll plug all the work that Strickland. Check out everything we dropped last week. We made it all of it free. Um, Stacey even gave you a bonus pod that he did with Matt Issa. Um, but there's every, everything that you normally have to pay for on the Patreon. We may open that up, made that free for everybody. So check that out if you want to get an idea of what you get with uh, the access that you get with the Patreon. So uh, definitely check it all out. Articles, a lot of stuff out, available on the website. Um, but yeah, that is our show for today. Hope everybody enjoyed that. Unless you're Carmelo Anthony, in which case you definitely didn't enjoy it. Also, why would you be listening to this podcast for Carmelo Anthony? Who knows? Who could say? Maybe he's just into podcasts, next podcast. Uh, all right, that is the show for today. Thank you to Bet uh, Bet Online, our sponsor. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Hope everybody has a great rest of the week. And I'll see you on Friday. Peace.